begin with and uh, for this matter i would love to introduce our today's speaker so i will proceed with it so we have neil peterson with us he was born in cape town south africa during the apartheid era in a poverty stricken family and with physical disabilities neil peterson now is an entrepreneur founder of the no barriers a motivational speaking business and international award winning author of journey of a hope merchant international speaker and global investor and a seller as well who has single handedly completed a yacht race around the world 27000 miles 9 months alone at the sea in a small yacht he designed and built by himself he is a thought provoking and well informed business speaker and a master storyteller who has been subjected to the pbs documentary and has successfully delivered keynotes at multiple events for ibm aig microsoft cisco and many more neil believes that it is all about being passionate and having a vision and purpose in the life he shows by his life example there are no barriers rather on solutions Neil Pedersen is one of the most inspiring, dynamic, and thought-provoking speakers one will ever witness. So, we're on this platform, and we are so glad to have you right here with us. Well, good morning. It is wonderful to be uh, on your uh, EP talks, and we uh, have had to do a little bit of quick. Uh, readjustments because I'm at my Caribbean island home in the Dominican Republic, and as you know, when you live on an island, things happen. And so, five minutes before we were going live, we lost power, so I've had to go to the backup system. And but we still have a show, and that is about being adaptable. As entrepreneurs, we truly have to be flexible and adaptable to whatever the circumstances are, because the show must go on. Perfect. I totally agree with you, Neil. So. uh to begin with the session i really want to start uh, by mentioning few points to all of our cast audience the very first thing that i really want you all to know is that now we have a very dynamic personality with all of us and so is the reason his journey is so much inspiring to all of us so what we have done is we have divided this beautiful session into four perfect parts so we'll go step by step and that is how we will be proceeding and we will be ending up for, uh, at the question answer session okay so i really want you guys to be attentive and listen what exactly this dynamic personality has achieved in his own life so uh, neel sir you grew up in cape town right uh, south africa during the apartheid era and in a poor family with the childhood disabilities so i really want to ask you can you please give a glimpse of your childhood days to all of us So what I'd like to actually uh, start with is that uh, to to bring the ties between South Africa and India, and there is so much heritage of my country that has its roots that come from India as well, and you have to also remember that uh, uh, Gandhi studied in South Africa during the apartheid era, and he saw issues in South Africa, and he believed that he could help make changes. not just in south africa but in the world in particular in his home country your country india and he returned and so i grew up with the influence of uh, of people like gandhi on my family and my roots are also tied to india and apartheid in south africa was all about divide and conquer it was all about changing the economic narrative of being able to contain people's movements to empower a select few and the laws of the country were so written to restrict what we could do what school we could attend what hospital we could be born in what neighborhood we could live in uh, what job we could hold how much we could even earn and my mother was a very strong uh, activist against the apartheid but she also was very influenced by gandhi about passive resistance about non-violent resistance and about being outspoken and her whole philosophy was about lifting people up irrespective of their race their religion creed sex the whatever it is we have to become one people one nation and it was hard 
it was hard. And I don't know if you, uh, how much of your Indian history of uh, the, the struggles of independence that India went through, well, we went through the similar type of struggles, but some of them were very violent. And I was caught up in 1980 as a 13-year-old in the student sit-ins where the police tear gassed us. They brought the dogs to break us up when we were peacefully protesting in the anti-apartheid movement. And I'm lucky to have a face because one day a police officer pinned me to a fence with a dog in my face, literally this far from my face. And I could smell the breath of the dog and the spit from the dog as the dog was barking, growling in my face. And the only thing that saved my face was this policeman held a leash and only allowed the dog so far. So I've seen the, the horrors of apartheid firsthand. I grew up with those horrors. And my mother, we had to flee the country in 1976 uh, with the Soweto uprising, and we went to Europe, and where my mother spoke at the anti-apartheid movements. So to, to see systemic racism and the fight against it, and our victory of being able to abolish the apartheid uh, laws and come to a free election uh, was a tremendous accomplishment of my country. But our work is not done. We still have to deal with economics in the aftermath that uh, comes from colonial rule. But we also have to deal with issues in, in the globe of systemic racism that continues to happen in countries, including the United States. Uh, and uh, we are seeing right now a major shift in political ideologies in many, many countries that are so similar to the authoritarian rule that I experienced as a child in South Africa. And I'm very concerned about what is happening uh, in the United States, in Europe, in Asia, uh, of we are going backward. Absolutely. So I am uh, so uh, lucky to get in touch with you like a person who has gone through different sort of phases in his own life. And now that we know that you have been, uh, you know, you had a very long journey in the ocean, right? For, 20, for 27,000 miles and you were in a yacht which was built by yourself, right? And you were there in that yacht in between the ocean for more than nine months. So I would, re I would really like to ask you that what made you so much obstinate for the ocean and the sailing? So let's go back for a moment to that background of growing up in apartheid and I grew up in a working class family. My father was a laborer who he was a former diver who became a laborer, who became an alcoholic and could not hold down a job. My mother was a school teacher, as I mentioned. So we had no money. And I was also born with a physical disability. I only had one complete hip joint and I couldn't walk as a child. So I call those my, my three advantages. And I had to overcome the prejudice. I had to overcome the economic hardship. I had to overcome the physical uh, disability in order to survive. And my freedom came through being in the water and through the sea. And I went through water therapy. And so all of these, these elements uh, helped to shape what was possible and what could I do or could I not do. And the fight uh, of uh, having, having freedom. And I discovered that freedom through sailing, through the ocean. And that dream to be able to exert and to be my best self, that the sailing really, really opened up the world. But why stop at just dreaming of being a sailor? Why not think about owning a yacht? Why not think about going one step further and racing across the oceans of the world and ultimately uh, racing around the globe? So those were things that brought me closer and closer, but I had no money. And like so many startups with no money, you've got to become innovative, you've got to become creative on how you do these different things. And that became the birth of being an entrepreneur, of having a dream, and how do we fund the dream? And what does it take to be successful at achieving the dream? Fantastic. So, you know, Neil, uh, since we know the, uh, a part of your personal life as well, life was hard as you grew up, right? So, uh, by what was it that kept you motivated to face challenges all the way along? Well, yeah. You know, it was really sort of about people saying you can't do this. People saying you're black, you're disabled, you're working class, you don't belong here, you're not welcome here, it's impossible, give up. And I was given a choice of do I believe in those people? Do I think that they are right? 
And right. do I listen to the wisdom? Or do I believe in myself? Do I think about what can I accomplish? And it is not about proving your critics wrong. It is proving to yourself that you are right to dream. And it's going to be hard. Racing a boat is hard. Building a boat and getting to the start line was extremely challenging. But I had to develop that self-belief that I can do this. And I had to also develop the skills to bring volunteers together because no great success is achieved alone. And no great organization is built by yourself. It is built by bringing people together through cooperation, through collaboration, uh, through partnerships. And those were the skills that I had to quickly develop in order to succeed and then to survive. So I may be a solo sailor. I may have raced a boat alone around the world, but I truly wasn't alone. There was a support team behind me and there were volunteers who supported us as a, as a team. And there were more than 1,000 volunteers who worked with me around the globe over my eight-year professional racing career. Now, when you are running a campaign that's fully sponsored, uh, you hire people to do things for you. I had no money. I couldn't hire people to do those things for me. So instead, I had to find volunteers. And now, you've got to give them a call. You've got to give them a reason to believe in you. So you have to be a stronger leader. And when people give up their time and even bring resources, you have to be able to bring value to what is it in, in it for them. That is a very important component. This is not about you. This is not about your success. This is about the collective success that everybody else is going to share in the journey. And that is what keeps me going. That is what got me through the difficult times. And I was dismasted in one of the races around the world. I was hit by a Russian freighter. And I spent 15 days pumping to keep the boat afloat, to survive, to stay racing, to get to, to land, which turned out to be my finish line as well. And again, I wasn't doing this just for myself. I was doing this to try and help bring others uh, to, the, to the journey. And when I got hit by the freighter, mid-ocean, uh, that chaos and that, uh, that, that struggle, it was easy to give up. The easiest thing was give up, abandon the boat, climb onto the freighter, and just say, okay, I'll live another day, but I was going to lose everything. And when you've got everything to lose, there's also inside of you is a fight, a fight to survive, a fight to say, I can't give up. This is not the option. And that became the resolve, and those are the lessons of the sea that I have learned that I also use in the business arena. Because as an entrepreneur, you're going to face huge challenges and it's gonna be easy to listen to the critics who say, you'll never build that company, you'll never build that product. You are a woman or you are this or you are that, give up. My advice is never give up. Believe in yourself and believe in the team that you surround yourself by. Absolutely correct. I mean, this is a speechless moment for me right now because all of the youngsters that are actually seeing this session right now, they must know that giving up is not the only solution or giving up is not the only option that they can opt for. So basically, we just all have to make sure that we keep, uh, you know, belief in ourselves and we just go on. We just go on, go on and go on. So by this, I would really... Uh, try to move on to the very first part where we started upon that now since there were different phases that you went upon right so can you please share some of the incidences of uh, you know uh, what happened when there were racial discriminations in south africa so the conditions in south africa basically uh, under apartheid was very difficult to form your own business uh, the, the the way the laws were written so if you were a truly black South African, Kosa, Susutu, Zulu, the really dark skin, you had to have a passbook. Now, as I was classified colored, and we don't accept these terms, but the laws, the way they were written, they were, they were coloreds, they were Indians, and they were whites, and they were blacks. It was all about divide and conquer. And so what they determined as black, if you were born in one particular part of, of, the, of the country or the city, but your roots are somewhere else, or your tribal roots are somewhere else, you actually had no rights to where you were born. You basically were said, no, you have to live in a homeland. You belong in a homeland. Therefore, to be where you are now, you have to have a passport, which is like having a passport. And if you wanted to go from 
where you were born and residing to work. You had to have a job and the, the, oh, the person you were working for would basically put their address, your address, and would determine the route. And if you uh, diverge from that route, you are now breaking a law and the police could arrest you. If you didn't have your passport with you, you were also illegal. And so these were very harsh elements stacked against uh, the people of South Africa. And because of the way they div dividing and conquering, I was given a little bit more privilege than others. But because we all opposed South Africa, uh, the laws, apartheid, we all unified around being black South Africans. So it doesn't matter what the color of your skin was. If you disagreed with segregation, if you disagreed with apartheid, we banded together to fight it together because the victory was to keep people apart. And part of that victory and fight together was also learning to cooperate from a business perspective together, uh, supporting each other's companies, buying local, uh, buying from the small entrepreneur, the small business person, to be able to really truly help grow and to fight systemic racism and fight the big corporations who supported the racism. All right. So now proceeding, I mean, these were some of the very, you know, unexpected things that might have happened. I mean, were there any sort of physical abusing actions taken for this black South Africans people? Was that well, there, were lot, there were lots of components that were happening. So there was the internal struggle that was happening uh, in South Africa. But there also was the external, the sanctions that were being brought upon by other countries, the, uh, the economic boycotts, the sports boycotts that were being implied, uh, applied by foreign uh, powers to try and break systemic racism in the country. And so collectively, uh, the world knew what was right and what was wrong. And because people know what is right and what is wrong, apartheid was able to end. But in today's world, the lines of prejudice and uh, extremism is becoming very blurred and it's going back underground, but then it's coming back to the surface as well. And we are seeing what is happening in the United States with Black Lives Matter and how the Trump administration is undermining the rule of law, how the Trump administration are trying to silence journalists, uh, how they're trying to disenfranchise people from voting. And we are really losing democracy uh, around the world. And one of the big challenges we are also up against is democracy is being replaced by corpocracy. And this is where corporations are becoming so powerful that they are now dictating to governments what they can and cannot do. And corporations through their lobbying arm or through their, uh, their uh, uh, government affairs uh, department, the government relations department, are determining uh, what monies go to what politicians for re-election campaigns in order to get favorable economic status. And if they don't like uh, what they're getting in a country, they are trying to then jump jurisdictions to other countries to avoid taxation, to avoid uh, labor laws, to avoid uh, climate change, uh, being able to solve these 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 issues. So we we are facing huge economic, political, socio-economic, socio-geographic challenges that we're going to have to address. And we're going to have to address that through education. We're going to have to address that uh, as well through entrepreneurship. Uh, as small business owners, we are going to have to start becoming more successful in building our small businesses and supporting each other in small businesses to become a voice for justice and to do the right, the right thing. Right, absolutely correct me. I really would like to know that did you encounter encounter any of the racial discriminations as of now yet? Well, we still face a prejudice. It is a, I have a beautiful yacht uh, that we keep in the Caribbean. And yeah. a few years ago, I was anchored off an island and I went for a swim to a little beach where there were some people uh, just standing. There were older gentlemen standing there and they were wearing hats that uh, demonstrated that they were Vietnam vets and World War II survivors. And they saw me jump off the boat and go for a swim. And when I got to where they were, they started engaging me in a conversation and they said to me, wow, your boss has a nice boat. They automatically made an assumption based on the color of my skin that I had to be a worker on the boat, not the owner. And this was eight years ago. 
And, and I didn't bother to correct them because some people just don't worth wasting your breath on. Uh, and I just said, yes, uh, uh, she has a nice boat. And they wanted to know where have I taken the boss. And I never said, well, the, boat, the boss that you're thinking of happens to also be my wife on the boat. <laughs> it, uh, and after a few minutes, I extracted myself and I swam back to the boat and I wished them well. So, yes, I have still, I still do see prejudice. Uh, some, uh, some, some years ago, after 9-11, I was uh, in uh, Charlotte Airport uh, flying home. And mm -hmm. I was part of a, a leadership team that had an agreement uh, about uh, if the third levels reach uh, the second highest or highest uh, level in the, uh, the terrorism threat count, we don't fly commercial, we fly by private jet. And I was on my way home, it was a Friday evening, and they had just elevated the threat level to the second highest. So per my corporate uh, side, I was now supposed to wait for a corporate jet. But the amount of time it would take for the jet to come to where I was and get me home, I could be on a commercial flight and be home in no time. So I was talking to my travel department uh, that I'm going to take a commercial flight. And then I called my wife and said, I'm flying home commercial uh, on schedule. And once I'm having a conversation with her, two policemen show up. And I'm in the first class club, in the, in the, the private club in the airport. And they asked me to get on the telephone. And they said that they had been called by some person who said that there was a man with an accent talking about uh, the elevation of the threat levels and uh, that he was looking for a private jet. And they were called to come and investigate. And when they arrived at the first class lounge, they uh, said to the, uh, the women at the desk uh, what the situation is and uh, that there's somebody back there. And they said, oh, Mr. Peterson is all the way back there. He's one of our regulars. Uh, he's back there. Uh, he's the only person back there. And they basically had to come in and investigate because some person perceived uh, me as, as, as a threat. That was prejudice. That was not me being threatening or me being uh, controversial. That was somebody looking and saying, how can that person with that color of skin uh, be in that particular position? So yes, we are going to face prejudice no matter where in the world we are, no matter how young or old we are, and we have to find ways to fight this. We cannot be silent. Right. That does totally agree, Neil. Now, basically, moving to your sailing career, I mean, when we all came to know that, yes, you were in between the ocean for, you know, nine months, and nine months is not a small duration, right? So we really want to know that what exactly, I mean, how can you relate those uh, hardships, those challenges that you faced in during, you know, nine months, how do you relate those things with your own personal life? Or for that matter, with professional life as well? So, so firstly, the, I have to break the race up into two components. There is the planning and the preparation uh, that took years and years. And then there's the, the execution, which resulted in me being 195 days at sea alone in isolation. In other words, 195 days without a hug. That's hard for me. I love my hugs. <laughs> and, right. and so my boat was nicknamed by the South African media uh, and the South African yachting establishment as the floating coffin. And they said because my boat lacked so much equipment, uh, all these components, I would not be successful and they would not associate with a failure and somebody who may kill themselves because of what they lacked. What they didn't see was the grit that in spite of not having the best equipment, not having all the tools on the boat, I had sufficient in order to survive. And so when we come down to the point of execution, because I had to fight so hard to get to the start line, I was going to fight just as hard to get to the finish line. And there are things that we can't predict. When, if I leave the dock, if I have to think about every storm I'm going to face, uh, every life-threatening situation that's going to come, whether I break my mass in the middle of the ocean, or get hit by a freighter in the middle of the ocean, or serious equipment failure takes place, I don't have the spare part. I can't turn around and quickly sail back to go and get something that I need. So you've got to become very resilient out there. You've got to learn to adapt to the circumstances. You learn to take a deep breath and say, okay, this is bad weather. The bad weather shall come to pass as well. Or oh, there's no wind right now and I'm not moving and I'm frustrated. I'm running out of food. I'm running out of water. But I've got to keep nursing the boat every inch forward to get out of the no wind. Again, our actions uh, speak volumes. So in today's world as an entrepreneur, those same lessons 
of we're going to have economic hardship, we're going to have setbacks, we're going to have challenges, is how do we respond? And right now with the COVID-19 situation, we've been hit globally in a huge situation. And our problem is not just COVID-19 and the fight for our, our health and our survival. The fight is also going to be economics. We've got two different strat uh, uh, things to overcome. And the economic fight is going to be harder than the healthcare fight. Because so many people around the globe are being so impacted by losing their jobs, by losing their income, or entrepreneurs who now are uh, no customers, uh, or they may have made sales pre-COVID-19, but those customers are not paying the bill anymore uh, on sales that were made. So cash flow has been affected. We all have been affected. So we really have to look internal and say to ourselves, take a deep breath. This will come to pass. But how do I survive this week, this month, this year, maybe the next two years? How do I use this time to put the essentials on the table of survival, but to position? How do we position ourselves to gain skill? How do we position ourselves to uh, gain the knowledge, to gain the relationships? Those are very important elements in preparing for the next part of the post-COVID future. And we will come to a post-COVID future. All things will come to pass one way or the other. Yes. So when one doesn't have necessary resources, right? So he can easily give up on his dreams. And, uh, you know, but you still persisted. And then you made it possible. So what was the thing that kept you going on and that motivated you to do your vision to come, you know, to make your dream come true? So what was that one major factor? Well, I think one of the biggest things was failure just was not an option. Because if I failed, I died. It yeah. was very simple. I'm a, I'm a risk taker, but I'm a calculating risk taker. I'm not a blind, suicidal, uh, just throw caution to the wind. I'm very, very calculating. And so whilst I may not, not have had the financial resources, it did not mean I could not find the academic resources. So I utilized public libraries where I could use free books to learn about naval architecture, to learn about boat building, to learn about business, to learn about marketing strategies and how to create a business plan and look at this as a business. That stuff did not cost me money. That cost me time. And what I found to realize that the one thing we have only a limited amount of that we cannot squander is time. We know the day we are born, but we don't know the day we're going to die. What do we do in between with that time? It doesn't matter how rich you are. Look at people like Steve Jobs, who had billions and billions, but he could not beat his health crisis. And he perished because of a, a health reason. So it's not about money. And a lot of people think, well, if I have the money, I'll solve the problem. If you don't have the money, but you have the knowledge, and you have the attitude, and you build the relationships, you will solve the problem with the money. But you can have all the money in the world, but if you have the wrong attitude, and if you are not growing as a human being, if you're not developing the skills and developing the relationships with other people, no amount of money is going to save you. Yeah. So, so the first myth we must break uh, as entrepreneurs is that, oh, I don't have the money. Well, I say wrong. You will find a way. And people say, well, I've got this big idea but I can't do it because I don't have A, B, C, and D. So let's bring that back down to a boat. Building a yacht is a big idea. Racing a yacht around the world is even a big idea. But you know what? You've got to start somewhere. You've got to build the hull. And if you can't build the hull, you won't have the boat. You won't have the rest. And so you've got to lay down the first plank. And so even in any business, it doesn't matter how big your idea is, you've got to lay down the foundation. Yes. And the foundation you start may not be the structure you end up with. You may end up with something bigger and better. Uh, because when you surround yourself with good people and you find that real quality of people and you trust them and you give them incentives for them to be successful within the structure of what you're trying to create, you'll be amazed what people can do to help you to become successful. So, so for me, it's about people. 
people come first. People really, really matter. Those relationships really, really matter. And there are different levels and different depths of relationships that's going to determine uh, how much support you're going to get. And those intimate levels of relationships uh, are built with time, are built with caring, are built with communication, with honesty, with integrity. And you've got to come to this place of honesty and integrity in business. Your word is your bond. Yeah. The, now, this is really well said by you, Neil, that commitments also matter and not money can always, you know, make, you know, money cannot always help you out to come to the solution. So it is what matters is your confidence, your relationships, your knowledge, your attitude. Now, this is really well said. So I really yeah. want to ask you one question. I want, to catch you, I want to catch you off there for one second. So if I had one of the wealthiest men in California on my vessel some years ago, uh, we chose to meet in uh, Antigua based on the runway length and the availability of, of jet fuel because he had flown six hours on his private jet to come to come and sail with me because he wanted the experience of sailing with me. He had hired me as a keynote speaker uh, for his corporation and the people who were in the room who were in my audience had a minimum of $150 million invested in his fund. So this was a super, super exclusive meeting. And this was the founder and the CEO of the company who said at the end of my standing ovation keynote, he was, they were so blown away and impressed. He said, I have one favor to ask you. Can I sail with you? And so we arranged to meet in Antigua uh, between Christmas and New Year to sail to St. Bart's. And then we were going to visit on another friend's uh, mega yacht with a helicopter on the back of that boat. So we set sail from Antigua for St. Bart's on the third day that he had arrived. And we had the normal trade winds and he got seasick. And uh, he started throwing up and his wife got scared. And all of a sudden, all the money in the world mattered nothing. It was a total equalizer. At that moment, his entire life depended upon my skills as a sailor. Not my money, not his money, but on the relationship on me being able to keep him alive to get him to land safely. So people again think money is going to buy you things. Well, it buys you certain stuff, but it doesn't buy you the integrity. It doesn't buy you the relationship. It doesn't buy you uh, the true values of uh, human beings helping and supporting human beings and being good to each other. Absolutely. So do you really think that Life is just like the ocean and be like the sails. Is that yes, so? Well, yes, life is. It is. We're going to have the currents that's going to pull us in one direction. We're going to leave the known for the unknown. And you have to remember, uh, our bodies is, uh, is mostly water. We are water. And so the ocean is the biggest body of water. So in so many ways, we are tied in many, many aspects to the sea. And the sea is a very big part of our survival as a species on the planet. Uh, we are not called the blue planet because of blue sky. We call the blue planet because of the ocean. And our early uh, globalization, our early entrepreneurships were all Neil built sir, around uh, sea Neil sir, actually there's some network issue. Can you please uh, check your network once again? We cannot hear you properly. Uh-oh. Uh, there's nothing I can do. Darling, can you move that camera onto the side? The, the, the small camera. Uh, I'm not sure. Am I back? Oops. Darling, let me see if uh, we just end that. Uh, let me see if. Uh, Yeah, so we can uh, okay, okay. What I'm going to do is we're going to uh, uh, just take. Am I, am I back? Yeah. Okay. What what happened is the power uh, just returned, and so uh, the uh, systems were kicking in and switching, <laughs> switching over. Uh, this is this is this is Ireland. Uh, 
an island <laughs> island living. <laughs> yeah. That's nice. All right. So we wanted to hear again your perspective of about how do you compare life with an ocean and we as a sailors. Okay. So again, the the ocean, the ocean uh, has its currents. By the way, can you hear me again? Because the power just cut out again. Am I still okay? Yes, you are audible. Okay. So, so again, so the the, the ocean is ever changing, and the ocean is very unstable. We're going to have extreme weather, and we're going to have total calms. We have everything in between. Life is also like that. Uh, of where we may have one extreme from the other, but it's how do we adapt? That adaptability is so crucial. The ocean doesn't care if you're black, white, rich, poor, American, Indian, South African, Dominican Republic. It doesn't care. It's going to make us equally as wet. And we are all as equally vulnerable uh, in the world of, the, of, of, of Mother Nature. And so when we come down to, to our lives as human beings, we should not care what our nationalities are. We shouldn't care what our economic status is. Uh, or what our sexual orientation or preference is. We are human beings, and we need to treat each other with respect. We have to treat each other with dignity. The ocean demands that we respect it. It demands that we are uh, uh, mentally and physically at our best, because if we're not, the ocean will take our lives. And so again, as members of society, we have to be our best selves for the right reasons. It's not about our power, it's about our collective power. How do we pick people up? How do we make somebody else stronger and better? Because by doing that, we are going to be better. Yes, yes, yes. So I really want to know that now, since we all know that you have been to a solo yacht, I mean, a solo traveling journey, right? So what were your experiences about that? I mean, what were the feelings that you actually felt at that particular moment? Well, you might see well, different sharks, different fishes, you know, uh, dolphins around you. So how was well, that? Let me, let, me, let, me share, let me share one particular story uh, of coming around after I came around Cape Horn, the southernmost tip of the universe, the southernmost tip of, uh, the, uh, of, the, of the Americas. And I'm coming up near the Falkland Islands. And... I just passed through a very big fishing fleet and okay. the following morning after I'd left pass through this fishing fleet and dodging all these fishing ships, I saw some ripples on the water and I thought, oh, oh is that some wind coming? Because it is, they have the same signs as strong wind coming, but the ripples were not in the normal fashion and they kept coming and coming and I realized they were not ripples, they were dolphins. They were thousands and then tens of thousands of dolphins swimming past my boat and they were leaping out of the water doing backflips doing tail spins and they just for literally two hours just kept passing my boat and i took out my video camera and i set it up uh, to capture myself in the frame and to talk about this and in the background behind right behind me the dolphins were doing all kinds of things it's like they knew they were in a show and i actually was able to use that video clip in a television documentary uh, the PBS in America, in America, Public Broadcasting Services, and it's on YouTube and on our uh, website, the, the documentary about my voyage and my race around the world. And the clip of those dolphins is in that. So that was one of the most amazing sights. And then another piece of the, the dream and accomplishment. As a solo sailor, our goal, our dream is to get around Cape Horn. It is one of the most difficult and dangerous places on our planet. And more people have traveled into outer space uh, through the various space programs. More people have gone to outer space. More people have gone to the summit of Cape, uh, uh, the summit of Mount Everest, than who have sailed solo around the world via the Southern Ocean and via Cape Horn. So Cape Horn is our ultimate as a sailor. And when I was sailing uh, around the world, racing, racing around the world. Uh, in my first round the world race, my mentor was killed. He died trying to get to Cape Horn. He died 2,000 miles south of Cape Horn. I've had many friends in the different races who have lost their lives 
in the Southern Ocean. This is how difficult it is. When we make mistakes, when things go wrong, when the weather gets severe, we pay with our life. And, yeah. and so that dream to see Cape Horn. And on March 13th, 1999, I rounded Cape Horn after surviving a life-threatening storm, just huge waves, just slamming my boat and knocking me over. I had no sails up. The, and I'm hanging on for my dear life. And again, the next few minutes, bang, over again I go. The mass is in the water. The keel is in the sky. I'm submerged in the cockpit. I'm tied on my, by my harness. But uh, I'm drowning by, the, by, by, by water. And I don't know, am I sinking? Am I being rolled? It was just so violent. And then the next day, I'm still alive. And then I saw Cape Horn. And it was just... Uh, one of the greatest highlights, one of the greatest moments of my life to look north and to see a piece of land and knowing that there was no other continental land south of me. I was at the southernmost tip of our planet. And from here on, every mile to the north is a mile away from danger, is a mile closer towards the finish line, a mile closer to the people I love and want to be with, and a mile closer to the next stage and, and opportunities that my life is going to have. So that was just uh, a, an epic moment in my yacht racing career. And it's a, it's a story I share in my keynotes. And I show a video in my keynotes uh, of coming to Cape Horn because it was such a monumental moment in my life. And a few months, uh, not long after that, I was dealing with a businessman and we were involved in an organization where there's a lot of money involved and I was becoming a part of the team, but I disagreed with the strategy. And this one particular businessman ended up uh, terminating my relationship uh, uh, with the business. And I'd been on a number of calls during my yacht race with my business contacts and business leadership because I had a satellite telephone. So I really never missed a board meeting. And so here I am, I finished the race and I've been speaking about my, my life threatening situation with Cape Horn. And I'm in the boardroom and we have this fight and I lose the boardroom fight. And so I'm leaving the, uh, the hotel and I'm coming down the elevator now to head for the airport and the businessman who helped, who fired me steps into the elevator and he acknowledges me and I acknowledge him. And he looked at me and says, you know, for a guy who's just lost a lot of money, you're pretty chipper. And I said, I've just lost money. Do you remember the storm that I spoke about around Cape Horn? If I lost there, I lost my life. Yeah, I've just lost money. And he didn't understand that until a few months later when he had a very, very severe heart attack. And he uh, uh, sent for me and sent a private jet to fetch me. And they were running out of time. And so when I landed, they had a helicopter to fly me to the hospital because uh, he, he needed to talk to me. And he took his oxygen mask and he said to me, I now know, I now understand what you mean about fighting for your life. And an hour later, he died. And so again, yeah. we've got to pick our battles. We've got to know what is our life worth. And it's not by the terms of money. It's about our experiences. It's about the relationships. Who's going to miss you when you are gone? Who's going to feel the void of what did you bring to their life because you were here? That is the legacy. And we have to live our lives around what is the legacy we're going to leave behind. Yeah, so that is well said. I really want to ask a very important question that uh, that has been actually asked by our audience as well. I mean, you know, attitude brings a lot many things within you. When you really try to encounter new challenges in your own life, when you really try to explore more, that is how, I mean, attitude is one of the major key which plays a very definite role, right? So how did your attitude change, you know, by having a solo journey in between the ocean? Well, firstly, let's go back to uh, attitude is something that you are raised with. Uh, yeah. It comes down to when your parents are teaching you right from wrong, uh, they are pu putting you in situations that you can learn. And so there are so many young people today who have been so protected in how they've been raised. And in being protected, they've not been given the chance to truly grow. And we don't learn from our successes as much as we learn from our mistakes 
and our setbacks. I don't like the word failure because failure means we've totally given up. But when we have challenges and when we have setbacks, it is what is the lesson we are trying to learn from that? And on the ICs, I faced many, many challenges. I had many setbacks. I was dismasted and I had to drop out of a race. Uh, I was hit by a freighter and I had to spend 15 days pumping to keep the boat afloat and to try and stay, stay racing. Those were setbacks. But they taught me to be innovative. They taught me to think outside of the box. Uh, they, those situations gave me choices. And how I responded to those choices were really, really critical on the high seas. Another situation I faced was the boat I designed and built. I built it for a race across the North Atlantic. I did not build that boat to race it around the world. I believe that if I was successful in the transatlantic race, I would find the sponsorship for a new boat. Well, I never found the sponsorship. I never got the money to, uh, to build another boat, uh, buy a new boat or even a second-hand boat uh, for the race. So I was faced with that, a dilemma. Do I give up the dream or do I adapt and modify? So the boat I built was 38 foot. The minimum size around the world race was 40 foot. So the question is, how big is my problem? My problem is not a new boat. My problem in that case was just two feet. If I could extend the back of the boat and make the boat meet all the safety requirements of the race, that boat would now qualify as a 40 footer, the minimum size, and I would have the minimum experience that was needed to enter the race. So when somebody saw a challenge of your boat is too small, you can't go, I found an opportunity. And I knew I was not going to win the race. I was not going to be first. But what I did realize was I could be one of the bigger personalities of the race because I could show that courage, that determination, that dedication, that innovativeness to the dream. And by taking the smallest boat, and I raced the smallest boat to race around the world in that particular style of, of, of race, I was one of the lowest funded uh, campaigns. And I finished the race. And there were people with millions and millions of dollars in sponsorship who had everything, the most successful campaigns, the most successful teams to support them, the most uh, experience. And I beat them across the finish line. And I beat them for one reason. I finished and they did not. You yeah. can't win if you can't finish. But you can't win if you don't start. And that is one of the biggest components, one of the biggest mistakes people make is they are too afraid to start. They think about what they don't have. They think about, well, what if I fail? Uh, what if something goes wrong? Uh, uh, what if, what if? Well, we've got to overcome that mental barrier and start to think, what if I succeed? What if I achieve this goal? What if I live beyond my greatest imagined potential? What if I build the most amazing relationships that give me things that I can't even dream of? And I want to give you another example. In 1999, after the round the world race, I was ashore and my girlfriend of eight years, who had been my support team, who headed up my support team, she had been a critical part of, the, of my racing career. And this was a woman I thought I was gonna spend the rest of my life with, the woman I thought I was going to marry. The last leg of the race, she left me. She ended the relationship because she didn't want to live like this. She didn't want to live in the fear that I may die on the next voyage. Uh, the, the, the challenges that I was constantly facing out there uh, what to, what became too much for her. And she didn't want to ask me to stop sailing uh, either. Sailing. So she chose to leave the relationship. And I was devastated. And I moved ashore at the end of the race. I stopped racing because I couldn't see how to race without her being a part of my, my team. My life was, was a mess. It was a shambles. And I'm living in a cottage. And I was working on Journey of Hope Merchant, my autobiography. And I was making the television documentary and a bunch of other things was happening when in August of 99, three months after the race had ended, I had a brush fire and I lost everything. I lost the manuscripts of my book. I lost uh, my trophy for finishing the race. Uh, I lost uh, the, uh, the trophies that I'd won other races with, uh, my photographs. All of that was gone. And I was just, as I said, I was devastated. And it was a front page newspaper story. Peterson burns down house. And a stranger read about the story in the newspaper. And this stranger uh, telephoned me through a rotary club. 
and I belong to the Rotary Club, and I believe uh, that uh, Surge India is supported by one of the Rotary, Rotary Clubs, and this is another amazing organization. And I was supported by the Rotarians uh, during my yacht race and after the yacht race uh, at the time of this fire. And so the stranger contacted me through the Rotary Club and got my phone number and telephoned me and said, what can I do to help? And I needed a lift to the car dealer because my car had fallen apart as well. And we ended up uh, picking up a new car. I ended up, well, not a new, new, but uh, a replacement car. We ended up going uh, to a movie. We ended up going to, to having a dinner and we never stopped seeing each other. We were married four months later. In one of the most difficult times, one of the worst times, I met the woman who became my wife. Darling, come and join us here for a second. Come and just put your head by my shoulder. Everybody. <laughs> it's a, and <laughs> and uh, darling and I now, we're celebrating our 20 years of being married, 20 years of traveling the world and conquering challenges and overcoming fears and inspiring other leaders, inspiring women to become entrepreneurs, to be able to, to, uh, uh, to be their best self. And we have a lot of work to do and darling and I do a lot of work together. And we do, and we will continue to do that. Because that's what we believe in, in bringing people up and empowering people to be their best self. And we can all share some of the examples and the things that we've overcome with other people because you don't have to do it alone. Right. Absolutely right. So we are so glad to have a, such a beautiful couple here with us. And we, on the behalf of Surge India International, we truly congratulate the 20 years of togetherness for both of you. So congratulations again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. you know, and so, so it's, again, I cannot stress more the value of relationships and the value of intimate relationships, the value of people learning to trust each other and learning to expect the best uh, out of each other to support. And I just saw uh, a second ago, uh, Juliana, uh, and I can't pronounce Juliana your last name, Nibao, uh, but, uh, but Juliana who actually connected me uh, to Surge uh, India and to your team, who's another entrepreneur, uh, and I believe she's going to be doing a show with you on September the 4th. Yeah. And so, so through our connection to India and some mutual friends in India, Juliana and I were introduced and we started talking about a lot of different aspects of, of, of life and business and success. And we've traveled to meet in different parts of the world. We've met in Switzerland. We've met in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Germany, uh, in Berlin. We visited our home. We met uh, uh, in uh, uh, the, uh, 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 Prague. We've met in uh, uh, Ireland. We constantly have traveled to see how can we empower each other? How can we lift people up? How can we help make a difference? I'm on the show with you right now because of her. Uh, and she's going to share things of her journey that I possibly contributed towards helping picking her up and being there and being the shoulder and being the, uh, the, the, uh, the ability to uh, bounce ideas off and to what do you think of this or how do I solve that? Or sometimes, sometimes we just down. Sometimes we just struggle uh, and we just need somebody to give us that little pep talk or that little push to say it's going to be okay. We're going to get through this. These are the critical relationships that take time, that take attention. And this is where, again, our integrity, our transparency, our, our honesty are so critical to make things happen. And, as, uh, and, up to, and this is a message to young women uh, who are underserved in our leadership roles. You are not strong enough in the world of politics. You are not visible enough in the world of corporate business. This has to change. Yeah. There is no difference between who you as a woman or I as a man is. There is actually no difference in our capabilities and our intellect. We may look at things differently. We may feel things differently because we come from slightly different perspectives. Uh, I can't be a child as a man, but you as a woman, you know what it's like to give life. So you look at life and the value of life slightly different to how I'm going to look at it. Uh, and so there is a different uh, a sense of caring and empathy that women have that men don't have. And when I look at the global structures 
of men have been in power for so long, for so many centuries. And look at the mess we find the world in right now. Uh, and look at the mess we find ourselves in COVID. The countries who are failing at COVID are run by authoritarian dictators. And the countries who are actually doing very well in combating the COVID-19 are countries that are actually led by women. And it's time for the men to step aside. And it's time for women to fight for that place and to rise to that place of leadership, to that place of taking charge and saying, we're going to do things differently. It is, we truly need a, a, a change and we have to fight climate change. We have a major challenge uh, that's coming with climate change. And climate change is going to take a different type of leadership mindset to, to solving these problems. So we need our young women to come into this place uh, of, making, of making the difference, of making that impact. Yeah. So that is really well said that I am, I and my whole team of Surge India International, we are so much thankful to Yuliana ma'am for giving us this beautiful opportunity to get in touch with you like a dynamic personality. So basically, uh, by here, I really want uh, all of those people who are connected with us to know that uh, me is actually author and of two most important books. I mean, one of the, you know, they are the best selling books. The first one is No Barriers, as his company name is also No Barriers. And another one is The Journey of a Hope Merchant. Mm -hmm. So for this, Neil, sir, I really want you to give a small takeaway from this sort of books. What would be well, that? Okay, firstly, to the Journey of a Hope Merchant incorporates uh, No Barriers. So the more important piece of work to read of mine is Journey of Hope Merchant, and I won the National Out Book Award in the United States for best book in 2005. And we do also have uh, a lot of things on our website and our social media of where I'm doing a lot of uh, mini series and mini shows around entrepreneurship and around uh, making uh, a change and becoming a stronger and better leader. So I continue to write, and I'm doing a lot with now video to, to video blogs, vlogs, to try and see how we're going to lift people up and move our economic uh, uh, community forward. And so I'm in the process of building a new company that is built around people, purpose, planet. And when we can focus on our planet, because we only have one world, if we destroy this planet, we have nothing else. We have nowhere else to go. We can't say, beam me up, Scotty, to somewhere else. This is it. We have Mother Earth. We need to treat her as our mother with the respect she deserves. And so it comes down to, we can't do this alone. We've got to bring people with us and lift people up to be successful. And what is our purpose? Why are we doing these things? So that's another very important element of what I'm trying to bring across, of uh, supporting our global purpose. And when we do those three things properly, we are now going to have a profit. Uh, the profit is secondary. Uh, and we will have a profit in so many ways that we can't uh, even comprehend. But we cannot have a profit at the expense of our planet. We cannot have a profit at the expense of our society, at the expense uh, of uh, people doing the right thing. So this is very, very important. And as Surge India, as you are growing, I want to again speak directly to our young entrepreneurs that uh, you have an ability to go out there and help grow this organization, bring people, share the, the content of the other components that have been part of not just the EP talks, but the other parts of the Surge India uh, side, uh, that whole uh, conversation around the unspoken. We've got to start to work together and cooperate and utilize our social media to bring about changes. And it's not about playing video games. It's not about they're just having mindless texting and chatting and swiping left and swiping right. Technology is a tool and a tool to be utilized wisely and smartly to empower us, uh, to educate us. There is so much fantastic information online today that uh, we are a global society and there's no excuse why we cannot get the knowledge base to be successful. Uh, it is now about cooperation, it's about collaboration. And so the technology is going to be a leveling factor. It's going to uh, be an equalizer of the playing field. So now young people in India are going to have some of the same opportunities that people in America or people in Europe have had. But it's how you use your time. 
if you're using your time to escape, if you're using your time just for amusement, uh, just to, uh, oh, well, what, whatever, or if you're using your time to build a knowledge base and to build relationships, you can be global players. And India has one of the youngest educated populations on the planet. You're a large population. You're going to be a force to reckon with if you can get down to the values. And I'm not talking about the economic values. I'm talking about the human values. Uh, in my time and travels in India, I've got to know a lot of your country. And I'm going to be very critical here. Many times we ask people, can you do this? They say, yes, we can. Yes, man, we can do this. Yes, sir, we can do this. And they don't follow through. You've got to follow through. You've got to start understanding how does business work? And uh, your word is your bond. Your actions are going to speak volumes. And you've got to bring up the lower parts of the culture and the lower parts of your society. You've got to elevate them. This is not about having huge bank accounts. This is utilizing the scope of the mass of population and the, uh, the roots that you have that can really make a big, big impact on the world. And I want to go back to... We travel to India for our healthcare. We do Ayurvedic, uh, Ayurveda uh, medicine, 5,000 year tradition that is steeped in the roots of Kerala in your country uh, that has helped save our lives and will help make our quality of our lives uh, better. So again, you have a foundation of doing amazing things. And again, sort of, uh, I've met doctors and dentists and uh, leaders in your country uh, who are as good as anybody else in the world. So there's no excuses. You can do this. But you have to now focus on the entrepreneurs of India, the small farmer, the small businessman, uh, the persons who have been left out of the global economy has to be brought along. And again, this is not about big business. If we can grow more and more small companies, when the big businesses fail, we will not have the systemic economic challenges that's going to come, that's going to hit us in the next 12 to 24 months because there are going to be many, many corporate failures that's going to happen. But the small business, so if we lose 10% of our big corporations, that's 10% of, of global employees are going to suffer and so many other components. If we lost 20% of our entrepreneurs, our small business, the impact is not going to be felt as we felt if something happens to the big companies. So as we move forward as a society, it's not going to be in the hands of the small business. And as small business leaders, we are in touch with our communities. So again, we can make the climate change uh, arguments in our local communities because we're feeling it. We can make the political demands of our mayors and our elected officials because guess what? They're one of us. And we come from the bottom up to make the changes in government and then to make the changes in big business and how they're going to do things. We have that ability to vote with our dollars, our vote with our rupees, vote with our euros on how we do things. That power is in our hands and we will not allow governments and big companies to take that power away from us as human beings, not to take our plans away. We can do this, but it's going to be done with respect. It's going to be done mindfully. It's going to be done by elevating people, not tearing people down. And this is where the United States is in trouble because the political structure in the United States has become very divisive about tearing people down. What we're seeing with Brexit and what, what the Boris Johnson administration has done uh, in, the, in the UK, again, dividing people, tearing people down, they are on the wrong side of history. Let us make sure that we are on the right side of history by always doing the right thing. Yeah. So basically turning on to the next point that I really want to go upon is we already know that you have also uh, documented a PBS documentary, right? So we really want to know that wasn't it, I mean, how was it possible to showcase all of your entire life journey through that PBS documentary? Well, it doesn't sh showcase my entire life. It, it showcases just one wedge of my life uh, around my background of South Africa and my sailing. And that documentary is now 20 years old. It's time for some very creative filmmaker to partner with me and let's go and do another film. Let's go and do a real Hollywood, Bollywood uh, blockbuster right. uh, type, type story of what is possible, of how can this kid from 
poverty in South Africa with a disability uh, and apartheid rise to the global stage. And let's find a way not just to tell my story, but to give other people the hope and the inspiration that they can do this too. If I can do it, so can you. And our work and utilizing the social media uh, utilizing our Instagram pages and our Facebook pages, uh, our, uh, our LinkedIn pages, and then utilizing uh, things like the WeChat that we are using now and all the other virtual conferences. Here is our opportunity to take control and to start saying enough of the BS, enough uh, of the, uh, the mindless stuff. Here's how we're going to be successful. Here's the strategy we're going to use to be successful. That power truly is in our hand. It's not about our past. We can't change our past. I've learned from my past, but I'm living in the now as I prepare for that future. And I know what that future is going to look like and what it should look like. And I want to see what kind of people are going to be a part of my future. But it's about the actions we take right now. So again, to every entrepreneur here on the EP uh, Talks uh, program, don't focus on what you don't have. Don't focus on what you've done in the past. Learn from that. And don't worry about what you don't have in the future. Start to look at what you've got right now. Because now is what that counts. Now is what matters. And now is where we start to collaborate, to work together, to brainstorm, to innovate, to problem solve, so that we can have that future. Absolutely. So, Sir Virginia would be so glad to get in touch with you again for the collaboration and we would seriously like to, you know, help people know that yes, they can do much more better than what they are doing right now. So basically, turning on from the social aspect, from the lifelong aspect to the business point of view, I would like to ask you that how is No Barriers International unique in its own way? Well, I'm... My story is unique and No Barriers is built around being a solo entrepreneur. So Darlene handles uh, my, my sales and marketing of my speaking business. And we traveled before COVID all over the globe, uh, speaking to organizations. That's how I came to India multiple times. I also speak at big, big conferences uh, in, in India and in other parts of Asia and obviously Europe and the United States. And the client list uh, goes from the Microsofts, the Cisco's, the okay. Intel's, the IBM's, uh, big governments, uh, the Bermudan government, the U.S. government. Uh, the, so, so there are just so many different organizations that are very well known and then others that you've never even heard of that, uh, that uh, we've worked with. We even had a lot of the, the CTOs, including some of the leadership from Tata Industries uh, at, at conferences. So again, it's about people knowing people. And No Barriers is about sharing the message of hope and helping to create the strategies of success. And last year, we worked with a Canadian company uh, for the entire year. I spent, uh, Darlene, I traveled to Toronto two weeks out of every month and sometimes even a little bit longer each month to help companies to be able to take their ideas and empower the employees to present those ideas on stage effectively. We helped train uh, those employees. And now in today's world, we are going to have to, again, create ways utilizing the technology uh, uh, like we're using now to, again, empower people to bring the ideas forward effectively, clearly, concisely, to, to be able to communicate, to be successful. Success has its own language that we have to, to, to speak. And so No Barriers is built around how do we elevate utilizing public speaking to elevate business and business leadership and to elevate entrepreneurs and to elevate political thought that is going to coalesce uh, us as a, as, a human, uh, as a human species. And then I have other companies as well. We built a Airbnb portfolio, uh, which is in the United States and Dominican Republic. And, and so uh, we have a lot of uh, vacation rental guests from around the globe who, who come. We have our yacht, which right now is in South America. And we are post-COVID, we'll go back to our plan of sailing around the world. And this is cruising, not racing, to uh, visit other islands, to interact with uh, leaders in those countries and with everyday people. And we're using the yacht as a platform of bringing young thought leaders together. When I was in Bermuda, 
uh, we brought young people together, we, we brought young political leaders together to solve problems in their countries. And we're just providing a platform for that communication. And hopefully, maybe at some point, the yacht will end up in India, because uh, our plan is to come to Asia. But is to link the, uh, the island nations as we cross the Pacific, and also to talk about climate change. As a sailor, I am seeing the impact of climate change. Uh, last week, we had a tropical storm come across Hispaniola, and by the time it left uh, the Cuban waters, it turned into a, uh, a, a hurricane. And then on Thursday, it was a Category 4 hurricane that battered Louisiana in the United States. But we are seeing the impact of climate change. Three right. years ago, I was hit by Hurricane Maria. I was actually in a Category 4 hurricane uh, fighting for my life. So climate change is not a hoax. Climate change is real. It's happening. I've seen this progression over my life, and I've been sailing the Caribbean uh, for the last 35 years. I'm seeing multiple changes in the island chain uh, that is a direct result of climate change. So again, I'm using my business uh, to address these issues, to again, get young leaders to start thinking of how are we going to conduct business in an ethical way that does not harm our planet and enhances our ability as a species to actually survive. If we don't change, we as mankind will not survive. Yes, absolutely. So, uh, Neil, sir, being a, uh, you know, a very known keynote businessman and also a keynote speaker and a storyteller, now since you mentioned that all of the entrepreneurs here connected to all of us right now, so what is one major factor or one major guideline that you really want to share with all of us youngsters? What is that? Well, I, I, I'm going to say very clear. You've got to have courage. You've got to be okay. willing to fail. You've got to be willing to take setbacks. You've got to be willing to have your heart broken in order to be successful. And it is not about the failure. It's how do you recover? And what do you learn from that? If you don't try, you will never know what is possible. If you don't leave the safety of the dock, you'll never know what it's like to arrive across the other side of an ocean. So as entrepreneurs, have the courage to try and have the fortitude to go through the setbacks, to get to the other side of survival, and to bring people along on the journey, to elevate people in that journey. This is not about just yourself. This is not just about your survival. It's about our collective collaboration. So when we get over our fear, uh, when we learn to start taking the risks, then we really start having that ability to learn. And when we get into that learning mindset, then we are never going to stop learning. I still learn. I still read books. I still listen to podcasts. I am curious. I'm hungry to know more. I want to know more people closely. I want to get intimate and close uh, to what makes somebody tick and what can that person teach me. And then in the process, what can they learn from my experience and my perspective? So again, it is about people. So when you have the courage to do things, you bring the people together. And when you have that team around you, now you worry about the product. Now you think about what you can do with that talent and that skill. But you don't forget your roots. You don't forget the people who've helped you. There are so many people I've helped become successful and when they've made their money, I never hear from them. Well, I have no patience for that because I want to see a gift that as we become successful, we keep plowing back in. We keep investing in others. This is not a gift for ourselves, this is a gift for others. So we've got to turn our success into the ability to help others become successful and they have to understand that their success is not just because of ourselves, but now an obligation for them to also lift other people. So we are an inverted pyramid. If Schneer, you and I can help uh, two people, uh, now it's four of us who've done something but now we can multiply that. Now we can help eight people. And then suddenly it's 16 people. And then it's 64 people. This is exponential growth. And that exponential growth is how we can solve these big, big challenges by starting in the grassroots and working and collaborating together. That is the strongest message I can give. Be courageous. Be curious. Be collaborative. And we'll get there. Yes, Neil. 
So basically, uh, you know, moving on to the very last and the most important question from my side is just that what all are the changes that you are, you know, expecting to see globally by post COVID-19? Well, how we do business is not going to go back and be the same way. So we are going to now come into an era of reinvention and big corporations how they did things, being able to fly people all over the world quickly for meetings, that is over. It's now going to be done, a lot of this is going to be done electronically. So we're going to have to learn to embrace uh, technology to collaborate around the world. How education is delivered is also going to change because we're now discovering that kids can learn uh, through online uh, learning. And so... So people who are living in remote locations and living in isolated uh, places are going to get access to knowledge if we can solve the technology problem. So we are going to have to put a bigger and bigger focus on bringing broadband access globally to all corners of this planet so that we can reach people in the furthest and most remote parts of the world to be able to interact, to teach, to share. So even things like telemedicine, uh, we're going to see a huge spike and huge growth in, these, in these, uh, uh, these, these aspects. So I am optimistic that in a post-COVID world, that those who can adapt to change fast and who can learn to survive and not contract the disease right. uh, and, and stay uh, healthy and stay uh, mentally sane and stay growing, this is our future. This is an opportunity for us. Uh, we did not ask for COVID. Uh, we did not ask for the type of responses that governments have failed to, to deliver. We are now dealt with the consequences of COVID. And we are also dealt with the incompetence of several governments in how they are dealing with the response to COVID. But in spite of these incompetences, uh, they, as entrepreneurs, we now have opportunities to survive, to prosper, to accelerate. But we cannot forget to bring others along in this journey. Right. Absolutely, Neil. So we totally agree with you. And we we'll try our level best to, you know, make ourselves that much adaptable so that we, we would be ready to face any sort of challenges, right? So hereby we'll start with the question and answer session, if that is okay for you, or you want yep. to add something else. Well, again, let's go into the q and I'm curious to hear. I'm seeing a lot of comments popping up on the screen. I can't read yes. them because they're so small. So uh, let's get the audience involved and let's, let's hear from them. Yeah, sure. So I'll start reading up the uh, questions and then you can answer them. Is that fine? So let's take one question at a time. Yeah, sure. So the very first is, as Sir said, that we are moving backward and world economy isn't getting better from as the market requires a potential difference between sets of people in order to get the workflow how can we get equal distribution of basic requirements in the human population as we see one percent of the world's population owns around 70 percent of the resources so that is actually a major major challenge that's a really great uh, question and we have as a society we have been putting the focus on celebrating the wrong kind of success. Uh, the movie stars, uh, the big successful business billionaire. They have made so much on the backs of others and have not distributed that wealth back into the community. And we have to change the metric of our scoreboard. It's not about how much money you make. It's not about how much power you have. It's about how many people are you empowering. So we are going to have to uh, rethink how we do business and how we look at government. So we have a chance to, uh, to reevaluate and to take a different path to what we are taking right now. The role of governments uh, have worked uh, in the interest of certain people, but not in the interest of everybody, because too many governments now have become hijacked by, sp by specialized uh, interests. So we as people have to start taking personal responsibility. So one of those first things we have to start doing is we've got to vote. 
We've got to get out there and we've got to vote. We've got to start voting for our mayors and our city councillors. We've got to start getting involved in our local politics, uh, our, our local organizations. And we've got to start holding people accountable. And we've got to start holding each other accountable and each other to a higher standard. And so we are not going to necessarily win the fight initially between the haves and the have-nots. That 1% is awfully powerful and have a lot of different types of resources they can use against the populations. But what they can't do is they can't stop us from getting knowledge. We are the ones who have to obtain the knowledge. It's not about being given knowledge. It's about our quest to obtain knowledge. I did not go to university. I chose to go to a trade school. But I also chose to stay reading books. I chose to use my public libraries. I chose to sit at the knees of great business leaders and learn from their mistakes and their successes. I chose to learn from small entrepreneurs who were trying to build things and didn't have all the answers. But the important aspect is I chose to learn. And I now have a tremendous amount of knowledge where I get asked by universities to come and teach. And I look at many professors who have PhD, but they have no practical input because they've not been out in the trenches actually working and learning uh, out in the field. So how we learn has to change now, and how we teach has to change. So our first big focus, if we're going to address the wealth gap, is we have to address education. And a part of that, we have to, we are not, I'm not interested in equality. I don't believe in equality. And I'm going to say that again. I don't believe in equality. And don't take this out of context, because there's another piece that's going to come to this. I believe in equitability. We have to be able to reach down and pick people up and lift them past where we are and elevate them. Equitability is what we need to be striving towards. If you are successful and you want to just bring others up to your level by giving them the same opportunities that you have, is not enough. Right. Uh, we are dealing with a society that have so many people left behind that if we are going to focus on equality, we are going to be left in the same place where we are today. We have to move beyond. And part of our equitability is we cannot be threatened as males. We cannot be threatened by smart, intelligent women. We have to celebrate that smart, intelligent women. My mother was a smart woman was intelligent, was courageous. She showed an example of what she could achieve. She was a, uh, uh, some people saw her physically small in stature. Uh, some people just saw her as a, as a teacher. She was so much more. She was a powerhouse. I watched my mother challenge governors and prime ministers uh, of countries and hold them to a higher standard and hold them uh, accountable. This is what we've got to do. We've got to now bring our voice together. And as young women, you've got to speak up. And the Me Too movement uh, is very essential. But also the Me Too movement has to become, uh, has to evolve as well and not allow itself to be hijacked or to be abused. There are a lot of women who have been abused. Their voices have to be heard. And uh, we have to start putting uh, the, the right context on where we are. So to me, it is very, very important that we elevate our women leaders and not about coming back to a place of equality, but a place of elevation, because we need a new mindset. We need a new way of looking at these, at the, at the, at these challenges and these issues. Yes. All right. So moving on to the next uh, very question, it is what for all our qualities, common businessman, a globally recognized business magnet. Sorry, you broke up the the internet just faded. You had to repeat that question. Yeah, sure. All right. So the next question is, uh, what all are the qualities that make a businessman a globally recognized business magnet? Okay. So let's change the narrative for a second. And it's not about trying to become recognized globally. That is part of what has got us in our trouble that we are in today as a society. Uh, people are seeking fame. People are seeking attention. And if we are going to do things because we want to be famous, we want the attention, we are doing it for the wrong reasons. 
So let's start getting our reasons right. Uh, we want to become successful business leaders because of the contribution we can make to our society, the people we can pick up, the lives that we can impact, the next generation that we can empower. That is where we're going to start now coming to create our metrics of how we measure success. And our definition of success uh, is not about the size of your bank account. I know some people with huge bank accounts that are total failures. There are people with huge bank accounts that I do not want to spend five minutes of my time with because it's a waste of my time. And there are people who don't have any money in the bank account, but are good people who are honest, hardworking, high integrity. So that is where we've got to come to now. We've got to start focusing on our, our values, our human values, our integrity, and start to work in our community. And yes, we have a global community because of technology. So we are not limited by where we can, but we are still a community. Right now, I'm a part of the Search India community from Dominican Republic, connected through Germany. And your roots are in Canada. So uh, let's start to focus on what is the message? What is the outcome? What kind of uh, life do we want to have? And let's start to design that life by how do we be, want to be remembered? Do, you, do we want to be remembered as the guy or the woman who had all the money in the world but had no soul? Or do we want to be remembered as being that person who was generous, who was empowering, who was uplifting, who gave everything to somebody else because they could and they wanted to because it was the right thing to do? The second one, perhaps. Yeah. So it is, we got a chance to make a difference. What is your legacy? and work backward of how do you want to be remembered? And now when you know how you want to be remembered, now what are the actions you're gonna take each and every day to achieve that legacy? Because let's be real, the day we take our last breath and we leave this body behind, we are not taking our fancy house, our fancy yacht, our fancy clothes, our fancy cars with us in yeah. this life. We leave all of that behind. And are we going to be missed? Are we going to be missed not because, oh, we had stuff? Or are we going to be missed because of how we made people feel? How we elevated people? How we made people realize that they were important? That they had the strength to also be successful and make a difference? Yes. So I really appreciate this. I mean, this is one of the most important things that every youngster should really believe upon that not only money, fame, image, fancy wear, you know, luxurious lifestyle is what counts in your life, rather how you treat people and how do you build up relationships with. So this is what counts really. And this is what is, you know, actually missed when you are not uh, uh, having presence uh, here on this uh, beautiful planet. So moving on to the very next hold question. Hold on, hold on for a second. Before you go to the next question, there's something important I want to interject. Yeah. There, is a, there is a book I want to challenge every member of Surge India and every person listening to this podcast to go and get and go and read. That book is called The Billionaire Who Was Not, The Billionaire Who Wasn't. And it is a story of Charles Feeney. It's not written by Charles, it's written by another author, but it's about the story and the life of Charles Feeney. So let me put it in the context. Charles Feeney built a company known as Duty Free. It's in every airport around the globe. It became a multi-billion dollar company. And Charles was a mega billionaire. And Charles came to a point in his life where he realized his success was not in building a company. His success was not in how much money he had. His success was how could he impact and change the world. And Charles has had a huge impact in changing the world. <laughs> He's given away all of his money. It's taken him decades to give away all of his money to be able to fight causes. He was in involved in the Northern, Irish, the Northern Irish peace negotiations. He was involved in uh, democracy and creating the constitution in South Africa. He's been involved in so many different things. And people don't know who Charles is. He doesn't fly on a private jet. He flies coach. He has a billionaire sitting in coach, sometimes next to the toilet. He doesn't have a stretch limousine and a Rolls Royce that takes him between meetings. He sometimes walks to get to those different meetings, to take public transport because he can. Uh, he doesn't stay in the fences of hotels. 
because he believes in effectively using his capital to impact people. So we've got to start changing our ego and our, 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 that ego mindset of accumulation to the mindset of contribution, of how are we going to use our success. So there's a very important book that every entrepreneur needs to read and needs to fully understand because that is a part of our obligation of success. And even people like Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, they have now studied uh, from, uh, from Chuck Feeney. They have now the, the billionaire pledge is not a Buffett uh, uh, Gates initiative. It's actually a, a Feeney initiative that they went to Chuck to figure out and learn from. Next question. For sure. So every member is going to read that particular book that you suggested us and we'll surely send you our reviews upon it. So thank you for the beautiful advice. The very next question is, if you were given the opportunity to bring a change in the education system, then what change would you like to make? Oh, gee, there are so, so many changes. So we actually have to go when a child is born. Uh, and the, the role of a mother, she has not just brought this child into the world. She's the connection and the, and the context that helps shape who we as human beings are going to be. My mother played such a critical role in elevating me, uh, in teaching me my values, in teaching me not to worry about what other people think, or what other people are doing, but to focus on what I need to think and what I need to do to do the right thing. So that education begins the day we are born. So we really have to find a way of how can we empower our women to be mothers and to be leaders. It is not one at the expense of the other. It is about having both. You brought life into the world, but you also have your own life. And it's to be able to combine those two elements uh, of being able to, to teach and to share. So from the moment that child is born, we've got to start teaching. And for our, our men, uh, the fathers of those children, to also become responsible, to become a co-equal parent in providing that education and providing that stability and providing that ability for the environment, for knowledge to really uh, foster. And so if we're going to fight poverty, we're going to start to fight poverty from the day a child is born. And that now comes down to how do we feed? How do we uh, bring about the knowledge base? If a child is hungry, a child can't learn. If a child is sick, a child can't learn. So again, we have to create that environment for a healthy mind by having a, a healthy physical environment. If a child has no roof over their head, they have no future. So before we start to really think about academics, we want to think about the very basic of life, that very fundamental component. And when we get that part right, now we have that ability for a child to go to school. Uh, to, uh, at five, four, five years of age to begin the next phase, not to start learning, but now to go to that next level of learning. And how we teach in schools is going to have to change. And we, are, we cannot teach this mechanism of memorization. Uh, today, with where technology is, we can look things up. So we have to now sow the seeds of curiosity. And we have to start to teach people how to learn that ability to, uh, to obtain information, to extract and interpret the information, that is absolutely critical. It's not about what you know now. It's about how do you access what you need to know and how do you utilize that knowledge. So again, as we come through the education system, and let's for a moment go to the uh, academia of university. Graduating from university is going to be different. That degree is going to give you the access to your first big job, your first real job, if you're going to work for a corporation. And that means you're only, you're only proving that you have the ability to learn and that you have the ability to adapt. And how are you going to now continue to compete for your future jobs? So how we work is going to change. And, and I believe that we need a multi-track learning facility 
Yes, universities are, are, are wonderful institutions and are great institutions, but it's not necessarily for every human being. We need the trade schools. Uh, we need to put the values back with working with our hands. And we have to bring the dignity back to working with our hands. I built my own boat because I could work with my hands. I didn't do that academically. I did that practically. And because I could work with my hands, not only could I build the boat, but I could fix the boat. And because I could fix the boat, I could stay racing and finish and be recognized as a global success as a sportsman. It is, but it is a combination of academics, curiosity, uh, practicality that enable us to come forward as a society. And so who we celebrate and what we value, we really truly have to start to look, to really look at, that, at, that, at that value structure. And we can't put people who work with their hands down and say they are lesser than people who work with their brains. That is not how this world functions. This is not how we are going to become successful as a society. Everybody has a role to play. If we turn the tap on and no water comes out of the tap, we're not going to turn to a computer and a computer scientist to ask why is there no water in the tap. We're going to turn to a plumber, somebody with a head. We are not going to survive if the dam is empty because the dam builder didn't do the right thing and do their job right through a practical component. So we're going to start assigning the value to the fundamental basics of human rights. Absolutely. All right. So moving on to the very next question, it, uh, it asks you that what will you want today's generation to give back to their community and society? Do the right thing. It's always, let us always focus on what is the right thing. Uh, how do we want our society to look? And based on how we want our society to look, what are the steps that it's going to take? And that is rooted in respect. So we've got to ask ourselves, what I do, is it right for myself? And we all can justify that. And there are really four questions here now, which then come to the second question. What I do, is it right for my family? And again, all the different things that we do, me as an entrepreneur is right for me. And it's also right for my, for my wife. We are entrepreneurs. And most people stop at doing these things just for our, ourselves. We should now come to the third question. What I do, is it right for my community? And today we are a global community. Look at how many countries this, this broadcast is reaching. We are not limited anymore. So we've got to focus on our community of doing the right thing. Not by ourselves and not by our family, but by our community. And now we come to the fourth question. Our world and our lives are finite. And I stand where I am today because of the giants who came in front of me and paved the way. People like my mother, people like Mahatma Gandhi, people like Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King, and so many other great leaders and many powerful women who have gone before us. I am a product of the success of that generation as I was once their young generation. So our fourth question, what we have to do, is what do we do that is going to be right by the future generations? So if we focus on question three and question four of how do we empower our communities and how do we empower the future generation, then how can we not do the right things by ourselves and our families? We will be benefactors if our political leadership, our economic leadership focuses on uplifting the community and future generations, we will have a very successful planet. And again, I cannot stress the importance of collaboration of our communities and these future generations. Absolutely. All right. So moving on to the next one. Uh, this is a very good question. Uh, your advice on how can a speaker hold the attention of his audience? Well, again, you've got to be authentic. Uh, I speak about my experience. I speak about where I've come from and the people I've met. And so the authentic uh, uh, element of who you are, you can't be some person on stage and then somebody else in private. You have to be the same person. And then it comes down to when you stand on the stage, you are not there to feed your ego. This is not about you. When you take the public light, when you are doing a broadcast like we are doing right now, 
or you're doing something with television. This is not about stroking your ego. This is about what can you share from what you have learned? How can you pick other people up? So we also have to have that ability to have empathy, to understand who our audience is. And it is to, to engage people. It is to sort of understand that everybody's going to have a different perspective, a different way. So we have to have respect. Uh, and so our ability to communicate as a speaker has to be rooted in the respect for our audience and the honor that our audience is giving us by giving us that time and attention for us to speak. So I take being a speaker very, very seriously. And so it truly to me is about how do we end up making people feel? It is uh, what is that empathy we evoke in somebody else to what they truly, truly are going to feel. And that's the connection. And when you make a connection, you're going to have success. But if you're going to talk on just some subject matter because you've written a book and you studied it in depth, but you're not believing it, you're not living in it, uh, then you are not authentic. Be authentic. Be your real self and be vulnerable on that stage. Every time I'm on that stage and I share a story, I make myself vulnerable. Life is about being vulnerable. Uh, and things are going to happen and we're going to recover from those things. But we move forward, we move on, and we move together. Very nicely said. So I just put that uh, life statement into the chat box so that every, everyone can make it their life title, right? So uh, moving on to the next one. Uh, as you said that you are not a blind risk taker, could you tell us few hidden factors that entrepreneurs usually ignore when making risk provisions? Well, I think some of the things that entrepreneurs don't pay enough attention to is the impact they're going to have on people. I, I think we, we focus too much on what we want and not yeah. enough on the customer. Who are we serving? Why are we serving them? When we come to the place of helping others, of being a servant leader, we are going to get a lot back in return more than we can imagine. And by focusing on the people and less on the profit, uh, in focusing on our environment and our culture, what kind of organization, what kind of culture, are you a culture of empowering your employees? Are you a culture of being open, of where people can come to you, where people can say, here is my challenge and here are my ideas? When we can have that uh, leadership of making people feel that they're actually able to contribute. I don't want to be the smartest person in the room. I want to be surrounded by smarter people. Because you know what? Those smarter people are going to help me be successful and they're going to help the team be successful and therefore they're going to help the organization be successful. All right. Okay. So this is a very insightful question for all of us. Now, the very next question is, so in your life, do you feel fear for anything? Do I feel fear for what? For anything. Yes, of course I feel fear. Uh, we, all, we all hate being rejected. Uh, <laughs> fear is a warning mechanism. And let's go back, uh, and I would have put on my guy hat. Uh, there was a woman that, at school uh, that I really, really liked. And I took a lot of courage to tell her I liked her. And she didn't like me in the same way. And so she rejected me. And that hit hard to the heart. It stung badly. And it had a huge impact in, in my future and how I went forward. Well, it worked out for the better for me in the end. Uh, her rejecting me, and you can read about that in my book. Her rejecting me changed the trajectory of my life. But we, we've got to recognize that fear is a tremendous learning warning mechanism. When I leave the dock, I have a healthy fear of the sea because I know how powerful that ocean is going to be. I know the size of those waves. I know there are going to be rocks that can, I can succumb to. I know there's going to be ships who can run me down. I know equipment is going to, to break. Things are going to go wrong on the boat. But because fear is my ally, I plan and I prepare and I gain the necessary skills so that when I face the challenge, I have the knowledge 
to be able to work through finding the solutions. I also uh, have people who I can reach out to if my telecommunications are working, that I can draw upon their knowledge to help me solve those problems. I don't have to do it alone. So when I see storm clouds building, I don't become afraid of the storm clouds. I pay attention to the storm clouds. And I say, which way are those storm clouds moving? Are they coming towards me? And if they're coming towards me, well, I better shorten down my sails. I better change my course because I have a big wind coming at me. And if I'm going to survive it, I've got to adapt. That is what fear is. So I am not afraid to try things, but I'm afraid to ignore the warning mechanisms. And again, in relationships, I am not afraid to jump into a relationship but when I see things are unhealthy, I am not afraid to make the changes that are needed. And again, this is a message to our young people. Don't be afraid of having relationships, but when a relationship becomes abusive, when the relationship is not working for you, when the relationship is not empowering you, if you are no longer contributing towards the relationship, be prepared to make the necessary changes. Be strong and be courageous to make those changes. But don't go through your life being afraid of the relationship. Don't go through your life thinking about all that can go wrong. Work towards what can be done right, what can be done that's going to be uplifting, and you'll be amazed by what you can achieve and how amazing your life can become. Okay, so whatever you said just right now was so relatable to all of our young people mindsets. And we truly believe that youngsters should actually be able to take you know, strong decisions that might be hard for them to digest, but yes, uh, they should be able to, you know, uh, take steps that are, you know, useful for their career as well. So I just pray this uh, for everyone who is connected with us right now. So moving up on to the next question, it is that, one second, yeah. What do you do in your spare time to relax and motivate yourself? <laughs> Spare time? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> you know, uh, I did use this time of COVID where I was not on a plane to catch up on my time with my wife and our relationship and what is important in our marriage and where we want to go forward and what we want to do differently in our life uh, together or what we want to in, uh, welcome more of. Uh, into into our life. So Dali and I spend a lot of time, more than any other couple uh, spends together. We have no secrets between each other. We share everything, our deepest, darkest secrets to our greatest successes. We share every aspect of who we are. And so we don't divide our time so much between business life and personal life. They're all interwoven because we only really have one life together. And there are people who are going to come into our lives and come out of our lives. There are going to be different types of relationships that are going to come in and out of, of, of our lives. So we learn to put all of these things into the right context of our communication and our, our strength and our support of each other and our elevation of each other. So, yes, I have a high stress in terms of some of the relationships and the leaders that I'm having to work with and the decisions that I'm having to make. There's a huge, huge amount of stress behind that, but I balanced it also with being on my boat and going sailing and being with people who really matter to me and who can bring a smile and laughter and elevation uh, to us and to Darlene and to myself uh, and to us individually as well. And, and I, enjoy, I enjoy time in my garden. Uh, I flew back to our Caribbean island estate to spend time uh, uh, playing in my pond and playing with my bamboos. Uh, because right now, sort of, uh, right, 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 right now, I can't be physically social and have a lot of people coming and going and visiting as we did uh, in the pre-COVID world. I built an earthen structure uh, that we turned into an Airbnb, uh, a very unique ancient cottage, ancient way of construction being done that uh, kept the pond became the walls of the, of the house, of the, of the structure. And now in my pond, I've got fish. And the next stage, I'm now turning uh, the, uh, the, the fertilizer of the fish to fertilizing plants. I'm getting it now ready to build a, uh, an aquaponic uh, addition to... Uh, so I'm always trying to figure things out and how things work and what makes things, things happen. So I like to be busy and I think Darlene... Okay. I would like to interject on something and that is that our anniversary um, is New Year's Eve. And every New Year's Eve, Neil says to me, he looks at me and he says, Darlene, 
what are your goals? What are your dreams for next year? And how can I support you? And I think that is such a, a powerful, such a beautiful um, way of supporting how we move forward together. Our interests are often the same because we align with a lot of things, but I may have different interests in Neil in regards to my passion for cooking and food cultures and, and, uh, and different things that are of interest to me. But Neil will engage and share what my interests are as I do with the love of sailing that Neil has. And so the most powerful thing, I think, that for a relationship to be able to look at each other and say, what are your goals? What are your dreams? And how can I support you? What are your needs? Yeah. yeah. You know, it's a, it's a beautiful, it, it just really is a beautiful thing. You know, and this is what partnerships are truly about. Uh, we get different things from different people. But uh, when you're in a marriage, when you're in a business, we tend to want to expect everything from the same person. Yeah. And it can't be done. Uh, one person can't be all components. So we, we are constantly trying to find how do we elevate each other. And sometimes our, our needs are conflicting. But again, it is that relationship, it is that communication, it is that trust. Those are the things that truly, truly make our marriage, make our business partnership, make our entrepreneurship truly, truly work. It's got to be rooted in respect, respect and communication. And to listen, to listen to what someone has to say. When, when Neil asks me that question, and to, during, during the course of our marriage and the days we spend together, if I have something to say, Neil listens. And I think that is extraordinary because a lot of people just don't. And it causes problems and it causes uh, tevers in their relationship. So I think that that's an important thing to remember in a relationship is to give the person time to speak but also to listen. Absolutely. So now I got to know that the beauty of your togetherness is just because of the communication and the bond that you guys share with each other. So this is a very good message for all of the youngsters who are in relationship with anyone. Might it be best friend, might it be boyfriend, might it be girlfriend, might it be with your parents. So thank you so much for this beautiful advice. Darling, and we are so glad to have you as well here with us. And I think also something that is very important for young people to know now is that I had a life before I met Neil. And Neil had a life of the woman that you heard about, Gwen, that was with Neil for eight years. And she loved Neil. If she didn't do what she did to help Neil achieve his dream, I don't think he would have been able to. And so, you know, love comes in many different ways, but there is no doubt that she absolutely loved Neil and that she believed in his dream and she helped him accomplish that. And so many people think that you have to erase the past. Like, I don't want to talk about Gwen or I don't want to meet Gwen or see Gwen. We welcome her at our table anytime she would like to come and spend time with us because these are the people that help you move forward. These are the people that loved you and love comes in many different ways, but these are the people that help you in life to teach you. I say people come into your life for a reason a season or a lifetime. And when you know which, you're never disappointed. Some people just vanish and you wonder where did they go? But they were only there to teach you something. They were there for a reason or only sometimes for a season. But and it's important to honor these people in your past. And you also don't realize how softly opportunity knocks. And when you have great relationships, uh, you're able to hear the knock. But uh, when you are caught in the labels, when you're caught in the fear, when you're focused on uh, what can go wrong, you are going to miss so many opportunities. Exactly. And I had passed, uh, I was uh, married uh, for 10 years and very young. When I was 16 years old, I married, I was a mother, and I was in that marriage for 10 years, and I left uh, that marriage for good reason. But I think that these are all things that teach us and temper us to be who we are today. So I don't look back at my life as a mother and a, and a wife at 16. Would I have done something different? If I, when you know better, you do better. But it was a circumstance that I was presented with and I did the best that I could. 
in regards to moving forward and being a strong woman and learning from that experience. And I, I would like to actually encourage uh, Darlene uh, to do a show on her experiences and on this very conversation. And maybe uh, somewhere in uh, one of our future Search India shows, maybe we can convince Darlene to, to be the guest. <laughs> you don't take much to convince me, I think. <laughs> Yeah. If there's anyone that would like to bring Neil and I together for a uh, time in a po podcast or uh, an opportunity like this for corporations or organizations, we're most open to that as well. For sure. So we would be glad to do that. And that would be a wonderful opportunity for all of us to learn so much from both of you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to move on. <laughs> All right. Okay. So that was a very wonderful time with Darlene. Now proceeding to uh, the question. It is please explain us how you spend your day right from the time you get up till the time you retire to the bed. Oh, wow, that's a very complicated because no two days are ever the same. Uh, it depends on where in the world I am. Am I one of my homes, because I've got multiple homes, am I on my yacht? Uh, am I preparing for a keynote? Am I working on another business idea? Am I with business partners? I have no routines. Uh, I don't get up and uh, go to an office. My office is my telephone. If I got an internet connection, my office is in my hand. And that's why I can also adapt very quickly. Uh, when the power went out in one part of our property, I could go somewhere else quickly and just move on and keep the show alive and keep the show going. Uh, so, so I also deal with multiple time zones. So it's not unusual to be up at three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning because the Asian market is coming online and I'm on the, uh, uh, the US uh, uh, East Coast. It is also not unusual for me to jump on a plane and fly trans ocean for a multi-hour, two, three hour meeting not even leave the airport and then fly back to Ocean to another part of the world. I've done three continents in 24 hours on one of my business trips because that's what it took. I ended up chartering a couple of private jets uh, because that's what it took to try and close that deal and jump on a commercial flight for a nine hour long haul uh, for the last component uh, and use the cabin of the plane uh, as my office. The, so I have no set routine. When I'm home with Darlene, we try to uh, have a cup of coffee together in the morning. And then if I don't have a high pressure day, I'll go to my pond, I'll go to the garden, or uh, I'll go and read. If I have a high pressure day, well, I tend to adapt. So as an entrepreneur, this is the nice thing is we get to design our lifestyle. We truly get to decide what our priorities are and who we want to spend our time with. And this is the difference in the mindset between being an employee. When you're an employee, you are on somebody else's clock. But when you own the company, you own your time. And when you own your time, you prioritize on where that attention has to be spent based on what are the challenges and what is uh, the important uh, uh, elements and who is important. So I always put the people in front of me first. So I may be talking to somebody and my phone may start buzzing messages. Well, I'm not going to answer the messages at the expense of my conversation with the person in front of me. But if the person's with me for a day or two, well, then I may say, hold on, uh, just give me 20 minutes to go and deal with a few messages. And so it's about structuring my time, but not allowing my telephone to dictate uh, what is important or not. I decide who and what is important. So I think the most, one of the most important things that I value is owning my time. And when you own your time, you're not going to tolerate fools. You're not going to tolerate what I call time thieves. People are going to waste your time. So it is, if uh, you are focused on certain aspects and somebody's not contributing towards that, well, then it's time to shift and move them along and move them on and get to what is important and who is important and why things are important. So no routine. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. So that was nice. So all right. So here was the end of all of the questions from the audiences. And now uh, moving on to the very last and important question for Surge India itself. And the question itself says that, what would you like to say about Surge, about our working pattern and our members, as well as about the Tejas, uh, who is the global representative for the organization? 
Well, I think what you are doing is phenomenal. And uh, Juliana shared some of the background as a young organization and where you are going and what you're trying to achieve. And I want to commend you for the, for the work and now uh, reaching beyond your network and starting to reach out uh, to other leaders. And well, we will start to start looking at which other leaders, like example, the idea of my wife uh, doing a show with you, uh, where else can you start to go? And it is about now bringing people together and it's about uh, implementing